All right, and just a couple of housekeeping things as we uh, get started here. So uh, this Friday call is typically reserved for uh, the Stacked Community SIP call, uh, where we would be going through you know, particular updates as it relates to changes in the Stacks block blockchain, any particular SIP proposals or new ideas that need to be discussed, uh, sometimes inviting on particular guests to discuss their ideas. Um, this week, as well as the next several uh, instances of the session that we'll be having on Fridays, will be dedicated to more educational sessions. Uh, so just as a heads up for some folks uh, that are normally joining, if you're uh, here for just normal SIP content, it will be a little bit different as we'll be diving into SDTC specifically today. So just, uh, just an FYI. Uh, but yeah, we'll get started here in a moment. All right, and it looks like we have a, a pretty good group assembled here, so I'm sure some people will continue to slip in over the next few minutes. So today we're uh, going to be uh, diving into a little bit more technical details of SBTC versus last week. Uh, last week we did a little bit of just an overview of SBTC, why it matters, um, you know, some of the high-level details of how it's implemented. So we'll look into a little bit more detail and continue that next, uh, next session in two weeks as well. Um, so as a quick agenda or uh, kind of overview of what we're going to be talking about today, uh, we'll do a really high level overview or review of what we covered last week. Uh, again, just kind of uh, about why SBTC is important. Um, then we'll dive into the SIP 10 standard and why that matters for SBTC. Um, a little bit more of an in-depth look at the peg in and peg out process, specifically as it relates to the role of the SBTC signer. Uh, then we'll jump into uh, some discussion around fees uh, for the entire process, how those get paid, who pays, uh, et cetera. Um, then we'll jump into uh, some details about threshold signatures, uh, specifically what they are, kind of why they uh, are needed and how they function uh, when the stackers are acting as signers. Um, and then uh, we'll get into uh, the various operating modes and recovery modes for SBTC as designed today. Uh, and then we'll just finish that up with a question and answer segment for any open items that uh, anyone on the call today would like to discuss. Um, but even though you see the Q&A there at the end, uh, please don't feel like you need to wait till the end uh, to be able to ask your questions. Feel free to you know, raise your hand or type it in chat, or even if you can come off mute and feel free to interrupt me if you have a question that's pertinent at that time. I'm sure if uh, one of you have a question on a particular topic, uh, then there's probably other people wondering the same thing. So it's, uh, it's definitely for the education of everyone here today. So uh, feel free to interrupt and, and get those questions answered. So I'm going to uh, quickly here, um, oops, let me go back and quickly dump these links into the chat for everybody, just so you have them. Um, these are, again, resources similar to the last week that we I uh, think will be fairly useful for people to just have handy if you wanted to get some more information on SBTC. Um, we'll refer to some of these links in the call today, um, but just so you have them there handy there in the chat. Uh, includes things like the white paper, um, the actual GitHub repositories for uh, the SBTC code as it exists today. Um, so lots of good resources there for you. In addition, um, this top um, point here for signing up for the SBTC developer release. Um, that was sign up sessions were through the 11th. So those that did sign up for the developer release, uh, you should have uh, started receiving emails with some details as to next steps uh, for being able to get uh, actively involved in that process if you were accepted. So if you did uh, sign up, please do check your email. Make sure if you did get um, contacted uh, by the Stacks Foundation, 
that you do kind of respond with the appropriate information to be able to get uh, to get tuned into that uh, in the future updates that will be giving us more information as to how to actually participate in the developer release. So uh, to recap from what we talked about last week, um, SBTC is really aimed at solving a particular problem of not necessarily having an ideal implementation of Bitcoin on top of the Stacks blockchain. Um, and SBTC uh, takes some of the fundamental characteristics of Stacks and uses them to build a new decentralized trustless and permissionless Bitcoin implementation on top of Stacks. Um, this is going to have the features as you see laid out here where you have open membership, where instead of it being a centralized custodian that's going to be responsible for maintaining and custodying people's Bitcoin and issuing uh, a tokenized version of Bitcoin on the blockchain, instead we have a dynamically changing set of signatories that will be essentially uh, processing the peg-ins and peg-outs of SBTC uh, and on-chain Bitcoin. Um, they're also going to have a lot of uh, cost reduction in this particular implementation as well, since the stackers have a built-in uh, economic incentive to process the SBTC peg-ins and peg-outs properly. Uh, that does actually give us quite a bit of cost savings in regards to fees, as we're not going to have, again, that centralized custodian that has to uh, make sure that they are uh, economically rewarded for maintaining that process. Um, and in addition to this, uh, due to just the design of Stacks itself, as well as uh, the updates that are coming in the Nakamoto release, which we'll be going into more depth on in the coming sessions after we finish going over SBTC, um, we're going to be getting a lot of the same Bitcoin finality guarantees that uh, you would expect from Bitcoin itself, as Stacks is uh, periodically going to be uh, essentially having that snapshot to the underlying L1 Bitcoin blockchain, uh, we will have the ability to recognize some of those benefits of Bitcoin finality as time goes on as well when moving around SBTC. So really it's trying to fit in a, uh, a sorely missing spot uh, within the Stacks ecosystem for uh, being able to utilize Bitcoin uh, and should open up a lot of development opportunities for using Bitcoin on Stacks as well. So with that at a high level, uh, just kind of how users would typically be interacting with SBTC, um, you know, you can imagine a user is going to want to peg in to SBTC with some on-chain Bitcoin. Uh, they're going to send it to an address that is essentially uh, maintained or managed by the, the SBTC signers, which in this case are going to be the stackers. Um, once they send that, um, the appropriate contracts for SBTC are going to recognize that uh, peg-in transaction and go ahead and process or mint uh, the associated one-to-one -one amount of SBTC on the Stacks blockchain and send it into an address uh, that was designated by the user when they began the initial Bitcoin transaction. And it's going to work much the same in the reverse for the peg-out process. And today we're going to be really diving uh, quite deep into kind of that middle step there that you see with the SBTC protocol multisig, um, essentially uh, how that is going to be done, how the signatories are going to arrive at their conclusion um, to be able to approve or deny a particular peg in or peg out request, and what happens uh, in cases where they are maybe acting out of uh, the, the typical behavior patterns that we would expect from them. So first, um, yeah, I think it's important to start with the SIP10 standard as that is going to be essentially what SBTC is uh, implementing uh, with its tokenized representation on the uh, Stacks blockchain. And for those that aren't familiar, SIP10 is essentially how we designate fungible tokens within the Stacks ecosystem um, and is going to provide the methods that are required for doing a lot of standard operations that you would come to expect with fungible tokens. So being able to send, receive, um, uh, query balances, have your tokens show up in supported wallets um, that support the Stacks ecosystem. Uh, implementing the SIP10 standard allows um, all of these other parts of the ecosystem to be able to interact with SBTC uh, without a lot of heavy lifting. 
a lot of these interfaces are going to be predefined and standardized, and it makes it very easy for developers to just kind of pick up and run with SBTC just like they would with any other fungible token on the Stacks blockchain. And um, as we kind of look at SBTC specifically, we can think of this as giving Bitcoin some additional capabilities that don't currently exist on the L1 based on SIP 10s being heavily utilized within DeFi on the Stacks blockchain. Um, you can think of being able to um, put this Bitcoin into liquidity pools, take loans against it in the DeFi protocol, any of those sorts of things already exist for other SIP 10 tokens uh, within the Stacks ecosystem. And now with SBTC, we'll be able to quickly plug into that. Uh, now it is worth noting that we already do have a SIP 10 representation of Bitcoin on the Stacks blockchain. However, um, that is done through XBTC today. Um, and as such, I think it's good to kind of dive into some of the differences between all of these various tokens. Um, but before we do that, um, I do think it's useful to actually take a look at um, an example implementation of SBTC. Um, and in this case, we're going to look at the SBTC mini uh, token implementation uh, as it exists on GitHub today. And we can see kind of how SBTC is going to be able to implement the same standard to be able to get all of those SIP10 capabilities. So if you were to go to the Stacks SBTC GitHub repository, um, you'll be able to go under the, uh, uh, the SBTC mini and the contracts area, and you'd be able to get exactly where I'm at uh, right here. And uh, in this case, you can see that uh, we are actually inheriting or importing a lot of the traits of the SIP10 standard. Um, and this is going to allow us to be able to implement a lot of those uh, functions that we come to expect with any SIP10. So being able to do uh, transfers, um, being able to qu query balances, get the particular symbol that represents that token. All of these are public functions that are implemented uh, along with um, defining with, with this particular clarity contract to be able to define that token. And SBTC is going to be no different. And so we can see here, um, SBTC Mini has these particular characteristics. But if we actually look on the Stacks Explorer, we can see that um, if you look at other SIP10 tokens, they have these same, uh, these same public functions available. Now, they might have additional functions that are necessarily for that particular, um, that particular token based on just the capabilities that that token needs for whatever apps it's used within. But if we scroll through here, you can see it still does have those standard SIP10 traits, uh, such as the public function for being able to define a transfer or the read-only functions for getting its name, getting its symbol. And these will essentially be what's utilized by the various wallets uh, and other software integrations within Stacks to be able to give SBTC the same capabilities that you come to expect with other SIP10 tokens. Um, and as I had mentioned, um, this is not the only um, implementation of Bitcoin. So if we look at XBTC, you'll see that this is doing the exact same thing where we have some read-only functions for being able to get balance, get name, et cetera. But we also have the uh, public function for transfer, if I can find it real quick, uh, somewhere in here. Initialize. Revoke tokens, uh, transfer, here we go. So essentially this is going to be following that same structure where you have a sender and a recipient and you're able to move those tokens to another principal or stacks address um, using this public function that is part of that SIP10 standard. Now, again, there are obviously other functions that are available here that aren't necessarily part of the standard SIP10 standard. In this case with XBTC, since it is something that is a custodial version of Bitcoin, you're going to have um, you know, uh, particular users that have the rights to mint or burn these XBTC tokens based upon that centralized custodian that's going to be managing it. But at the end of the day, in terms of how developers would be programmatically interacting with it, it all boils down to a very similar experience. So to jump back to our slides here um, and kind of give a little bit of a comparison between all of these various implementations, uh, here's like a little bit of a chart that I, I broke down for the differences between on-chain Bitcoin, wrapped Bitcoin, such as what you see with XBTC, 
and then what SBTC is going to be bringing to the table. And you can see that SBTC in a lot of ways is bringing about a blend of what you can get with on-chain Bitcoin, obviously with um, not necessarily the same uh, trust assumptions that you would have with L1 Bitcoin, um, but in a much better state than what you would see for wrapped Bitcoin solutions that really does require custodians to be involved in that process. But you do get the full smart contracting capability. Um, you do have for maintaining the peg instead of the custodial escrow, you do get the distributed POX miners that are going to be acting as the signatories. Um, and you are getting the benefit of no permission being required, no risk of a particular custodian censoring uh, your transactions as it really does just boil down to uh, a standard decentralized SIP10 that is on the Stacks blockchain. So with that in mind, um, we've mentioned it before that the signer is going to be a very important role within the SBTC ecosystem. So in this case, just what their duties generally will entail is uh, participating in the threshold signatures to authorize peg-ins as well as peg-outs. Um, so they will be collectively authorizing that and signing the transactions for uh, releasing Bitcoin back to the L1 to maintain that two-way peg. Uh, they will also be essentially in charge of tracking those particular UTXOs uh, while interacting with the SBTC contract in the Stacks blockchain. Um, they are going to be economically incentivized uh, to be processing all of these transactions in a timely fashion. Um, again, as we do have those economic incentives with those stackers receiving Bitcoin rewards for validly uh, upholding the consensus rules, um, they will uh, be motivated to make sure that those SBTC pegins and pegouts continue to process. Otherwise, their, uh, their stacks rewards uh, will be frozen. Um, so it's uh, very much something that they want to, uh, to process in a timely manner. And they will also be uh, responsible for uh, participating in the coordination with Stacker DB uh, for being able to actually uh, meet these, uh, get these threshold signatures um, uh, properly, uh, properly done so that you can actually uh, sign a transaction for processing the pegouts or for authorizing the, the pegins. Um, so they'll be following the protocol rules to maintain liveness of SBTC. Um, and again, they, they are incentivized to act honestly. So the process for PEGIN um, is essentially, um, there's going to be uh, an address that's going to be generated through the distributed key generation by the signers, actually. That's going to be where the funds will be deposited into. That address is actually going to change um, every stacking cycle. So um, as the, you know, as the uh, wallet is available for users to initiate a particular peg in, um, they will be sending their, their Bitcoin to that. We will be watching those transactions with the data that's within the op return to know what particular stacks address that SBTC should be uh, sent to when they're conducting that peg in. Once the miners, the Bitcoin miners, actually confirm that Bitcoin transaction and it's added into a block, the, um, the signers will essentially catch that, um, essentially with using the capability that Stacks has to be able to observe events that are happening within the Bitcoin blockchain. And they will um, coordinate to go ahead and make sure that that SBTC is, is minted appropriately in that user's wallet. Um, now, for the signer's perspective specifically, when they observe that new PEGIN transaction coming in, they're going to verify the validity of that using a, a Frost-based uh, mechanism. So for those that don't know, Frost is a threshold signature uh, mechanism that is used here, but it's also used in other areas within Bitcoin. And there's actually a specific implementation of it that's based on Frost that's used in this scenario that's uh, called WSTS. Um, so um, last week, we went through some of the definitions of various terms that are going to come up frequently within uh, conversations around SBTC. Um, so I definitely do recommend, uh, if you haven't had a chance to observe that, I do have those slides here at the end of this uh, presentation. We can kind of jump through some of those things as well. Um, but again, Frost is essentially going to be the mechanism that's used for validating threshold signatures so that once 70% of stackers are um, authorizing a particular action, 
uh, they can actually sign a regular Bitcoin transaction to be able to process a peg out or to authorize an action uh, within SBTC. So um, once they do, um, there is going to be essentially, once they receive that uh, on-chain Bitcoin, um, they're going to um, provide an authorization transaction, and that's going to have certain details around that particular peg-in. Uh, obviously, an important part of that is going to be the amount of Bitcoin that's going to be pegged in, the SBTC recipient address, uh, so where that SBTC should be going to, um, the various votes that essentially come in from the, um, the signers, so whether or not they are voting up, down, or just abstaining. Um, and then they're also going to be tracking the actual UTXO, so they'll, they'll have, in this case, a pointer to the PEG-IN UTXO. Um, this is where there is a little bit of wiggle room for being able to, when conducting peg outs, um, users being able to essentially suggest particular uh, UTXOs that should be considered for the peg out uh, transaction. Um, but even if that is not necessarily specified, um, the uh, signers are going to be the ones responsible for handling which UTXOs are ultimately uh, given back to users. And then um, there's also going to be uh, the peg and redeem script. So in case there actually is some issue uh, with the particular peg in process, it fails at some point in the process, users are able to recover their funds. And so that will also be part of it as well, where if there is something that goes wrong, uh, users would be able to uh, claim their actual native on-chain Bitcoin if they never actually were going to be receiving their SBTC. So to go through it in a little bit more details, um, again, so they'll be sending their uh, Bitcoin to a pay to taproot address um, that was going to essentially be um, generated or managed by the SBT signers. So they'll submit that Bitcoin transaction with op return once confirmed. Um, then the signers will observe that transaction. They'll coordinate to uh, sign that spend from that particular uh, pay to taproot output uh, that will go to their, their final wallet. Once that's verified, uh, then uh, SBTC is minted and returned to that user within their wallet. And now pegouts, um, they're going to be very similar in a lot of ways, obviously happening in the reverse with a couple of different details here and there. Um, but essentially, um, users are going to prepare um, uh, their Bitcoin address that they would like their funds to be sent to. Uh, when they submit that pegout request to the SBTC contract, that's going to have the details of the particular Bitcoin address that uh, that user should be receiving their funds on. Um, so that is going to be uh, handled by the SBTC contract. It's also going to lock that user's SBTC. So once that is received, uh, the signers can begin to coordinate to be able to actually uh, process that pegout transaction, select the UTXOs that should be utilized in that pegout. Um, and that could be uh, something that's assisted by the actual user initiating the peg out where they can specify or recommend particular UTXOs that should be utilized in that process. Um, the threshold signatures are essentially gathered, again, using Frost. Uh, once hitting that 70% threshold, that's broadcasted to, uh, to the Bitcoin network as a standard Bitcoin transaction. Um, SBTC contracts are going to be watching essentially for this. And once that is verified on the Bitcoin network, um, the SBTC will be burned. So, and then if again, uh, similar to last time with the peg-ins, um, if the threshold signatures are not submitted properly, um, they, they don't meet that threshold, uh, something goes wrong, um, the user will then have their right to uh, reclaim their locked SBTC. So now for the specific role of the signer in this case, when conducting that peg-out operation, um, they're going to verify that there is actually sufficient wallet UTXOs in most every scenario um, outside of us being in a recovery state, which we'll, we'll get into a little bit later. Um, those UTXOs should be available and should be able to be processed in a timely manner. Um, they'll be, again, responsible for that coordination, um, sharing that with the actual creating that transaction and sharing that with the miners broadcasting it. Um, they also will, in this case, um, you know, as we obviously have fees to deal with. Um, if there isn't high enough fees or something of that nature uh, actually going along with that particular transaction for the peg out, 
Um, this is where RBF or replaced by fee can be utilized by the signers to be able to up the fees to make sure that Bitcoin transactions still will go through. Um, and then once um, they confirm that peg out operation, it's going to be finalized with that Bitcoin being received in that user's wallet. Um, there is a redemption transaction that is part of this process as well, um, which is what the signers use to fulfill that request. Um, and that's going to, similar to the, uh, uh, on the, sign, the, the peg in side, it's going to just define some characteristics that the signers need to know to be able to properly process these transactions. Um, again, recommendations of the particular UTXOs. Um, and then there's also going to be data uh, tracked uh, by the contract for managing that particular UTXO state. So um, in a similar way, um, users will submit their peg out requests. Um, their uh, SBTC will be locked. Um, signers will coordinate to sign that transaction, broadcast that to the network. Um, once it's verified, SBTC will be uh, burned as the uh, user has already received their Bitcoin. Uh, I guess one thing that's worth noting is it is going to always be done in that order where uh, the SBTC will be first locked and it's not until the Bitcoin is actually confirmed in that user's wallet that the SBTC actually gets burned. So it happens in that order uh, in case anyone was curious. So um, there are um, some interesting items that would be good to note. So users do pay those fees for the peg-ins and peg-outs. Um, so this will help make sure that, you know, even in a volatile fee market, um, there's not going to be issues where the network is, uh, you know, or the, the system is losing funds or something like that due to having to cover fees for all of these operations. So users will be handling those fees of just the on-chain transactions. But it is good to note that unlike a lot of other Bitcoin implementations, there's no fees for the custodians managing the peg. And since stackers are already economically rewarded for their participation, uh, there's no additional fees that they are collecting for being able to process these transactions. Um, signers don't pay any fees either. So there's not, uh, the fees aren't coming out of their rewards or anything of that nature. Um, and then um, on the stacks miners, they will be including the signer transactions in the blocks for, fee for free. So there's not additional stacks network fees that they will be incurring. Um, and then for any other normal transactions of SBTC, um, fees are going to just be normal. So if you're doing a you know, stacks trans or a SBTC transfer from one user to another or using it in a smart contract, you can expect the fees to be the same as any other token that you're moving around or any other operation that you're doing within the, uh, the stacks blockchain. Now, uh, one thing I, I did want to point out um, as we were going through these various um, comparisons earlier, um, it is also worthwhile to take a look at, uh, let's think I had this pulled up here, um, to look at the uh, comparison versus other, uh, versus other implementations of decentralized Bitcoin um, on various blockchains, not just stacks. So if we go to uh, this here and we go to the PR for SBTC and look at the uh, SIP documentation itself as it exists today, we can actually see some details um, as to how this compares to some other um, implementations of Bitcoin. So if you are wondering how this compares to maybe your favorite alternative implementation of Bitcoin on other networks like Ethereum or Avalanche or et cetera, you can get some details as to how it uh, compares to those here. I definitely recommend taking a look just so you can see kind of how SBTC is uniquely positioned in terms of its trust assumptions, the economic incentives, how it maintains that two-way peg in a way that's very different than these other implementations. Um, so definitely would recommend taking a look here. Um, this is also a great place to go if you just have other various questions about um, SBTC and how the PEG process that we ran through today works. We'll be going through some of the failure scenarios, um, how SBT system can freeze in cases of the signers not uh, properly processing transactions, things like that. 
Um, that will all be outlined here within the SIP document itself, and we'll be running through that uh, in the, the next few slides as well. Um, let me pause really quick and see, are there any particular questions um, on SBTC? And I'm going to read the ones here in the, in the chat as well. Um, so I see here the question is, hi, my understanding for creating SBTC is to have the equivalent value in stacks for collateral. If true, um, this limits the number of Bitcoin that can be used, pegged in, um, into a programmable, useful SBTC. Um, how is this limitation can be addressed in the future? Um, so around that, I think they're referring to um, what was kind of defined in the white paper as a liveness ratio, essentially where based upon the value of stacks stacked within the protocol, um, there was a ratio that needed to be maintained. I believe it was uh, previously defined at 60%, where uh, if the value of Bitcoin um, that was being pegged in exceeded 60% of the total value of stacks that was stacked, then to make sure that economic incentives don't get out of alignment, additional peg-ins would not be allowed or processed until that valuation fell under that liveness ratio. In the most recent um, SIP for that, um, that has not been included. Um, I don't know if that's something that's being considered again for the future down the line. Um, maybe that's something that could be considered in a future change or update down the road. Um, but initially, instead, at this time, as the SIP is defined, it's going to initially just start off with a smaller cap of the total amount of Bitcoin that can be pegged in. I believe it's set at 100 Bitcoin. And that value can be changed again in the future after the protocol has been up and running for a little while. Um, that can be uh, decided to be increased um, all the way up to, you know, whatever is decided at that future date. Um, but right now, the liveness ratio is not, uh, not appearing to be uh, something that's going to be implemented, at least in this first uh, version of, of, the, of the SIP. I'm not sure if anybody um, you know, that's closer to the development has particular comments that they'd like to add to that. Um, but that's uh, the current understanding, uh, as I'm aware. And then um, the other question I see here in the chat is, uh, so pegging in requires waiting for the next Bitcoin block. Um, yeah, so essentially uh, we do need um, that Bitcoin transaction to be confirmed within the Bitcoin blockchain. We're not going to be able to, uh, you know, issue SBTC before that confirmation just because of, you know, kind of the standard operating procedure for Bitcoin. Uh, you know, there's not a, a zero confirmation type of system here. And especially given the fact that you know, users may be pegging in a large amount of money with, uh, uh, with Bitcoin moving it over to SBTC. We definitely don't want to uh, kind of have a, a, essentially a trust me bro type of situation where <laughs> users are able to, um, you know, get SBTC and double spend that actual Bitcoin on chain or something like that before a confirmation is actually in. So, um, yeah, you do need to wait, um, uh, you, you know, at least for that Bitcoin block to be confirmed before uh, SBTC is going to be issued. Any any other uh, questions on what's been talked about so far? All right. So jumping back into it. Um, so again, um, the frost uh process or as we're going to be using in this particular case, WSTS um, is the particular implementation that we have. Um, this is going to be um, essentially how signers are going to be running the distributed key generation to derive their keys. Um, so in this case, all of the signers are going to be getting essentially key shares that are generated um, by those users. Um, and those shares will be uh, combined together um, when they are actually kind of essentially coming together to vote on uh, whether or not to approve or deny a particular transaction to create um, the overall multi-sig process uh, where they approve or deny and actually generate a proper Bitcoin transaction if enough of them reach that particular threshold, in this case, 70%. So it's essentially a way of having all of these various stackers um, being able to create partial signatures that when combined 
gives a valid uh, public-private key pair that could be used for moving uh, the Bitcoin back and forth. And this is also going to be essentially how that uh, Bitcoin address that is used for processing deposits will be done as well. Um, so again, that 70% quorum is the big thing here. Um, this also indicates um, that all we really need to make sure that the funds do stay safe is 30% uh, of stackers uh, remaining audit, uh, honest uh, to make sure that uh, anybody that is trying to act nefarious, that they would need to get 70% um, to be able to actually cause any issues within uh, the SBTC signing process. Um, Stacker DB, which we'll be diving into in a little bit more detail in coming sessions, um, is going to essentially be what's used for that coordination between the various signers. Um, so that's going to be um, where uh, the various cryptographic data that's coming from signers are going to be used and synchronized between the various parties that will need to issue that threshold signature. Um, so they'll write all of those signatures, voting data, and all that to their particular DB chunks on their instance. And that data is replicated to all nodes. So this makes sure that um, all of the signers have that same view of what the other signers are doing as they uh, go ahead and issue their particular signatures and that can be validated across all of those nodes. Um, so that's how they essentially process those votes. And uh, it also uh, allows for it to remain decentralized. So there's not some centralized coordinator that has to process all of those transactions. StackerDB is going to essentially be the system that provides that decentralized method of communication and coordination. Um, and this also allows it to be done in an asynchronous process um, so that you can have that, dis that distributed signing group that can actually still get those uh, threshold signatures submitted in a secure way. So um, again, kind of breaking down some of the incentives for the signers um, as they are very critical to this pegging operation, obviously. Um, how we make sure that they continue to act honestly is largely based upon their incentives. So as we know, the signers are going to also be stackers. They'll be receiving Bitcoin rewards as uh, they do today. So um, through the proof of transfer process, um, they will put up their stacks. Uh, if they meet the thresholds, they will be receiving Bitcoin rewards as compensation for that. And now with the advent of SBTC, they will have that additional duty of uh, running StackerDB, of actually validating those uh, peg in and peg outs and voting to approve or reject those particular transactions. Um, and if they do decide to fail to sign those blocks, so if we're not meeting those thresholds, if these peg ins and peg outs aren't being processed properly, um, they will not be receiving their uh, Bitcoin rewards and those um, Honest, uh, those actions could also lead to uh, the potential forfeiture of their collateral as well. Um, this is going to be something that will be outlined in more detail, especially as we get into uh, the recovery mechanisms in case something ever were to go wrong with the system and how SBTC is designed in a way to be able to recover from those failure scenarios. Um, and it's partially due to the fact that we do have that uh, stacking rewards where it's native Bitcoin coming into those stackers those can actually be used as part of the recovery process to make sure that even if uh, stackers are somehow coordinating to operate in a dishonest way um, and you know, preventing proper peg ins and peg outs, users will still eventually be able to recover their funds through those POX rewards. Um, there really, though, at the end of the day, there's not much economic reason why uh, signers would want to um, act dishonestly. Again, they're cutting off their income and potentially putting their capital at risk. Um, but however, I will, you know, will state this is partially the logic that was behind that liveness ratio discussion that we were just having earlier, um, where making sure that uh, the amount of stacks that is stacked within the protocol has a high enough valuation to ensure that uh, everybody acts uh, in an honest way uh, was really the thinking behind that liveness ratio as discussed in the white paper. Uh, so again, I'm not sure if that um, is something that's still on the table for the future or not, but uh, at least in this initial version, uh, that's not something that's specifically um, implemented. However, with the 100 Bitcoin cap, that's going to be implemented at first, 
uh, we're practically getting the same uh, the same results of having uh, a limit on the amount of Bitcoin that can be pegged in that prevents uh, economic incentives uh, from getting out of alignment. Um, and in, re in reality, just similar to Bitcoin miners, um, really, it's always going to be uh, more profitable uh, to just act honestly, receive your rewards, uh, not lose the value of your stacks um, through either potentially slashing or even just causing the value of that stacks to go down due to dishonest behavior. Uh, so there are a lot of aligned incentives here for, uh, for folks to act honestly. So there is, um, uh, again, if stackers decide not to uh, process these transactions, um, there will be essentially a system freeze. Um, so this would be if they're failing to sign for multiple rounds or uh, they're not processing their key rotations as we go through from one stacking cycle to the next uh, and we're moving between Bitcoin addresses for the, that particular Bitcoin collateral that backs SDTC. So if they're not uh, doing this uh, properly, stacks, unlocks, and rewards will be halted during that freeze. So again, this gives them that direct economic incentive to make sure they begin to actually follow the protocol rules and resume um, processing those transactions properly, doing their key rotations properly. Um, otherwise, that stacks collateral becomes unavailable to them. Um, everything will resume, though, when stackers do resume their pending operations as uh, described by the protocol. So um, really, there's no benefit to holding this up. They're just losing their capital and making it not available to them. Uh, so getting, um, getting back involved will allow them to go ahead and resume. And as this is something that is very much uh, important for the overall incentives of the entire protocol, uh, if this does go on for too long, um, this could uh, potentially lead in a halt, um, but this is an unlikely scenario as uh, this would be quite, uh, quite the operation that the coordinated attackers would be doing to uh, fail at this level. Um, so I kind of had here just kind of reminder the, of users of the, the peg out operation, the various parties that would be involved in different parts of it. You can see, you know, as we go through a peg out or, you know, a peg in will look very similar. Those SDTC signers and the contracts will be kind of the, the heart of this entire process and will be um, instrumental in, uh, in this entire process of maintaining that peg. Uh, so they will have a very important role, and that is why we have those strong incentives for them to maintain honest behavior. Um, for those that are on the end, both users and the Bitcoin network, uh, really, they just have to continue to do what they normally do. Um, Bitcoin network validating Bitcoin transactions to be valid, um, but they don't really have to have much insight or really at all of what is going on within the Stacks blockchain. Um, it's just going to be the Bitcoin network and miners are just going to be following the standard Bitcoin protocol rules. And we really are just doing standard taproot transactions and using the frost mechanism that is a standard innovation that is used uh, within Bitcoin and other places as well as a way to generate those threshold signatures to produce a valid Bitcoin transaction. So it's really uh, not something that is going to affect those outside parties very much. Um, so as I had mentioned before, there is uh, kind of two operating modes for SBTC. There's the normal mode as well as the recovery mode. So right now, the normal mode is what's going to be initially uh, implemented with the recovery mode to be implemented at a future date in a separate SIP. Um, with the normal mode, SBTC is essentially backed one-to-one. -one. Um, yeah, everything is operating normally. Um, they're going to be processing those peg-ins and peg-outs just as we described in the earlier slides. Um, and there's not really anything um, too special going on here if uh, users aren't if the signers aren't acting honestly, um, they will be punished as we kind of described earlier. Um, and the recovery mode is really just to implement what I described earlier, where users would be able to still eventually recover their funds in the case of there being unexpected behavior by the signers for a long period of time. Um, so this would essentially allow those POX payouts to be redirected um, to the requests of any outstanding users to make sure that they are eventually made ho whole with their uh, Bitcoin um, that would maybe be not available or 
um, in a stuck state due to the signers uh, not acting in the way that they should. Um, so definitely keep an eye out for that. We'll, we'll have future sessions as that SIP uh, comes to life uh, to kind of update everybody on how that, how that all works. Um, but yeah, you can always keep an eye on the SIPs GitHub to see when that does come through exactly what that implementation is going to look like. So with that, that's kind of the, the main content I wanted to run through today. So I wanted to kind of pause and give some time for questions from the community, thoughts on anything that we went through today, maybe outstanding questions or topics that you hope we cover for uh, the next session of SBTC. Um, we will, I also will you know, kind of point out or, or comment on, we do plan on having uh, some surveys that we will be encouraging everybody to participate in. We'll be sending the first of those out after the next session. 